Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about assembling robots in Clip Studio Paint, March of Robots 2020 edition, presented and hosted by Tacosta Bailey. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd we'll like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraint, not all questions will be answered. Webinar will be recorded. Recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. Panelists are Fahim Nias, Joanna Brower, Mari Quinones, myself, and Dacosta Bailey. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time and have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is an all-in-one solution for stunning ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more about Clip Studio Paint on clipstudiopaint.net forward slash and and graphicsly.com. And with that, we'd like to pass the reins of the webinar over to Da Costa Bailey, who will begin his presentation. All right, thanks, Mario. Thanks everyone for joining in. It's uh, great to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I'd like to start by basically introducing myself. I'm obviously DaCosta Bailey, an illustrator, um, freelance designer living in Vancouver, Canada. And I've been working for embarrassingly a long time, uh, maybe 25 years doing this. So it's great to, it's great to have a space to uh, just be able to contribute um, my thoughts and ideas when it comes to being online and, and, and showing, showing process. Uh, what I'm gonna start out with is just a little point just a little uh dedication to a fellow named sid mead who passed away recently at the end of last year he's just a really big influence on my life um and my design style so this is some work he did obviously it's, this is a one of my favorite anime uh pieces and it's uh, it's a gundam but he did a thing called turn a and it was just very very big for me so it was, it's great i got all of my my seam lines you'll see throughout my work from him um so that was that was a big deal. So just to show a little, uh, some stuff what I'm doing, I've back in 2014, I started doing a little drawing uh, competition or, or um, event, kind of just a challenge for myself. And this is some of the, some of the elements that I've been working on in my, for that. And so this is a piece that was inspired by uh, Miyazaki uh, Hayao's film uh, Castle in the Sky or Lapira. Um, it's basically there's a robot version in there of a kind of a, a, a protector. And so I just did my version of, of that. And I'll just go through the pieces and you can see the ideas. Um, this is inspired by, uh, you know, bugs in general. And most of these, most of the ideas are pretty straightforward and, and, and just come off, come off pretty quick. I don't, I don't spend too much time thinking about them. But I just like to roll through the ideas and try to tell a little story. Um, so this is this is really what I'm talking about today is how to how to think, you know, when when I'm doing these designs. And and it's not really much about drawing. I think you can learn drawing from anybody. My lines are the same as probably anybody else's lines, but it's really about, you know, what I feel is a topic to focus on or or how I want to I love making certain shapes. Um bringing out the volumes and, and trying to express my ideas uh, through the image. Uh, this is another piece that was done and just, I love space. I'm a, I'm a huge futurist. Uh, I love the, the idea of, of, a, of a positive future and, and love to see where things are going. And I love, that's why I love technology. It's why robots are, are something I'm passionate about. It's another piece that uh, really, you know, obviously speaks to kind of the waste of technology and, and discarding of, of things that we make. 
it's a more recent piece. Just a lot of fun. Try to capture some kind of dynamics and the energy in a, in a robot form and, and really kind of get a sense of urgency. This piece is called Jailbreak, which is kind of funny to me that he's running for his, his quote unquote life. A little humorous piece that I did, um, basically, you know, it kind of speaks for itself. It's just a, the idea of anything can, with technology can be a power. Uh, so it's somehow this fish is, has worked his way up through the echelons and now is, has enough to, has enough presence to have a driver. Some fun exploration, uh, the closer mentioned piece before was just the idea of, of this wonderment of space and and the future. And this is a more recent piece that I did, uh, really just exploration of, of form. It was a, an old ink piece. I do a lot of work that sometimes I do half drawings and put them away. And this is a great way to kind of get something down on paper and out of your head. And then you come back to it later and revisit and, and do some more exploration and find the, you'll find that you know, you have new ideas and new interpretations of that, of that, the piece that you're working on. And it takes you in great, great places. Um, I also get, so I get a lot of questions about the forms and, and how, where I get my inspiration from. And the, probably the biggest driver for me is in, is nature. Uh, nature is infinitely fascinating, um, especially insects. Um, there are so many ideas and forms that just happen evolution is an amazing thing and and so i i say for my because my forms are very kind of organic and as much as they're heart surfacey things i like a lot of flow and like them to feel kind of smooth and, and very appealing so part of that is making sure that the forms um the forms are, are very very welcoming so i look looking at you know some of these animals whether it's you know, the, the pangolin or, or these beetles or the wasp. I mean, they're just fascinating forms to, to study. Um, and I would I suggest anybody, instead of looking at other, you know, typically people tend to want to look at other robots and, and other, other things. If you're designing cars, people go and look at cars. And that's, that's a great thing to see what's out there. But when it comes to finding your voice and, and really kind of shaping the idea, that you want to see, it's great to kind of find other sources that are that are related, but you know, inspiring in other ways. And you can you can see a lot um, when you study what nature has done because these are all adapting. Can, robots are about designing for a function and a purpose. So when it comes to designing form and function, it's 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 crucial. That I mean, those things need to be. It's nice when they're, they're married together and there's a beautiful balance. So trying to mimic that idea, and obviously the function is important because that's the primary, the primary push for the design. But then it's nice if it looks good. Then nobody wants a you know ugly piece of technology. And so just you know more exploration and understanding of the the variety of forms. And one of the things about robots that that are that people find difficult actually is that robots unlike kind of organic surfaces they're pretty absolute in terms of the way you have to have parts interact right there's a logic involved so hard shell animals you know anything with an exoskeleton they have to be able to negotiate the parts as it's moving because everything is armored it's not like a like a human or a flesh elbow or it just bends so you have to think about the connectivity of of, of these parts um, and then, and how they relate to, to one another. So this is the piece and I'll, I'll make apologies for the graphics issues. So this is one of the pieces that I did just kind of really super inspired by inchworms. I don't know why I like them so much, but, um, obviously you can see the form on the, on the left is the classic inchworm on some carpet. But then I took that and really just mechanized everything and really tried to keep the, the seam lines that run across it and really try to keep the flavor of what that, of what that needs to be. So it communicates the idea instantly when you look at it, you realize that it's an inchworm. 
So there's no there's no confusion there. And one of the one of the main things that I find that people always have trouble with is uh, joint joint language um, and how to make it feel realistic. So I mean, this is and and by means whatever I'm telling you is kind of my interpretation of things. There are certain elements that are are fact. Robots are robots are are are, are real. You know, they're one of the, the the genre, one of the elements of genre. You know, science fiction that ever become real. Vampires aren't going to be a thing. Dinosaurs, you know, questionably not going to be a thing. You know, zombies, no, but robots are an actual thing that has stepped out of out of the world of, of fiction and into the world of reality. So when it comes to designing these elements, there's a lot of things you have to take into consideration, you know, from how cartoony you want to be to how realistic and believable. And, and part of that is is the joint language. So the basic ideas of, of of the limbs and and how they they work. So you've got this this limb here you know which is a tube and it's it's basically very cartoony there's no need to really explore or explain what it does it just a, it's such a crink a crink joint which is not a real joint but um that's what it is and then of course you've got your classic uh arm bender style where it's a tube and the tube can be flexible and you can make an octopus or you can do whatever you want with that and kind of idea whether it's an, and these these all these principles apply to whether it's an arm or a leg you can they carry across and then you have also this spherical socket with floating limbs so that obviously in, in speaking at levels of technology it's taken into consideration when you're designing uh there are things to you know what is the technology that works with with this if you're working on something that's like a steampunk so you have very kind of deliberate joints so you have a lot of pivots um you can have all of these elements, but the magnetics, you know, you probably have to really explain that into really be really clearly that your your steampunk idea will support floating and anti-gravity kind of idea. Um, so usually the spherical socket is the easiest kind of one to kind of get away with in terms of being able to show something very physical, uh, very deliberate. And then so that's this is an exterior kind of ball socket, obviously held together more magnetically than anything else um, inside of here because you would normally have it where it's it's buried inside so that this rim actually holds actually holds the ball in place um, and then the next arm obviously here extended down is a is a, a rotational joint um, and that's basically what I like to focus on and what I'm talking about here are rotational joints and twisting joints. And then we can talk about uh, revolving joints. And that, but that's a whole other webinar. It can get really crazy when it comes to types of joints, linear joints and blah, blah, blah. So right now for me, just focusing on just to explain a real basic idea of when you're drawing things is how to understand the joint you're using. And the, both of these joints, be them rotational, are 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 set differently. So this is... The first one here you'll find is, is it's more like a Y joint, right? So you have an insert of the piece and then you have you still have your rotational axis around the center elbow per se. And then this is a side by side. Um, the second one is, is a side by side, whereas you still have the exact same rotational idea, but it's offset in a different way. And you find most, you know, if you look at kind of the Canada arm or some of the, you know, easy robotics or automotive robotics kind of work in that way. Um, it's, it's an easy place to offset because you have to have a motor to drive these things. So where that placement is happens is really important. And it's something to, to really take into consideration when you're, when you're working on these designs. And so the next off of that is, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the limb, I didn't do any feet. So there's not going to be a foot slide, but <laughs> because you get the idea. But the idea here is, is you know, when you're designing, obviously it's a level of cartooniness versus reality, as I said before. And hands versus pincers slash clamps. These are these are things you have to take into consideration and, and understanding of the function of the piece anatomy that will dictate kind of your design, your your solutions for the design challenges that you have. Um, and how you propose. And then the combination of all these elements kind of coming together are are what really kind of sell your story.
So I'm going to start off with a piece. This is a piece I did. This is a combination of many things I'll be posting online, but this is kind of a just a variety sample of kind of ideas, you know, just random thoughts that I've had um, over the last couple of days to put together for this. And we'll, I can focus in on, on one specifically. So let's, let's talk about initially, let's talk about the captain here, the captain of the guard. And he starts out, he's multiple layers. I tend to work very simply and I, I don't have a lot of tricks in terms of um, when I put things together, my, my, my process is pretty straightforward, not that different than drawing in a, in a real book. I don't, I'm not a concept artist with, you know, implied forms or anything. I just, I just draw straight. This is a shape and this is how it goes. And I try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, Cause the more, I find the more tricks that you use, the, the more convoluted the image tends to be, which is great if, you know, if you're doing in, you know, product design, you need, there's a, there's a place for all of that um, in terms of, expressing an idea and, and working and, and collaborating with other people but when i'm kind of selfishly developed a technique that's just all about me and the way i want to draw and, and what i needed to communicate quite quickly so just to go here so this is this is where this drawing kind of starts it's super ugly there's a lot of there's a lot of finding lines as they're called which are lines that i just i just draw things um and I just let them kind of happen. And I want to see, you know, what shape looks good. And I basically, obviously I've laid down kind of this idea of, of how big I need this gun to be, or, you know, tell you that this was driven by the fact that I needed something that was a variation on the others um, or, 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 or different from the other, the other drawings. But I was really actually trying to fill, um, actually trying to fill the space that that was left on the canvas so you know oops you know that was basically what i was trying to do is fill up that space with the character so that was which funny enough is is probably the minimum amount of driver that you need to say okay this is the design brief fill this space as so i i went with this kind of form um so to get back to that We'll see, like I said, the basic the idea is that I was just looking for a form, and I thought, oh, this is this is important to try to you know create something that 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 shows that shows an idea, tells a little bit of a story, um, and you wonder what he's doing or who this character is. And so from there, I'll break it down and go back onto my other form, the other image. And then this image, is made up of, of very few layers, to tell you the truth. So the first thing I first thing I really lay in is obviously the I get to the, the line work, and then once the line work is kind of solidified, and I think okay, this is a great form, and I've I've managed to negotiate all of the elements that feel good, whether it's, you know, the size of the hand or, or the boots. And then, you know, the first thing actually, the concept for this was just a big chunky mech with chunky parts, you know, was the idea. Um, so I wanted to kind of make something that had a lot of presence and had a lot of power, um, but was appealing to look at because I, I love friendly forms. And I think it's from a video game perspective. Um, I'm not a big designer of war things, but I love love machines that allow you to, you know, exploration and worlds that look fun. So from there, you know, I'm throwing in, um, I'm trying to make the color and it's actually, the color is actually done in multiple parts because from my process, I hate and love doing color because there's so many choices, but there aren't that many choices. I mean, there are only seven colors in the rainbow plus or minus, right? So if you do enough stuff, you realize, you know, if you look at the, the options you actually have, saturation and 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 you know and all the rest of that. You, sometimes I get caught up in in how I want to have a, an infinite variety, but but I feel like I can be limited. So sometimes I really don't know where to start. So I I really start by number one deciding what's gray, and then I put down the gray first, which actually becomes a layer. 
Um, and then I work from there, the flat, the flat of the whole thing becomes the base tone. So you, whatever color you put in, and I just, I don't care what it is. It could be super hot pink. It just needs to take up the, take up the space and start filling in um, what I see. And then when I automatically, when I decide where the metal is, and the metal can be any color, I just decide that it's going to be gray um, for the most part. That that helps immediately break up, um, break up the form and it lets me move forward. So the next thing I do on top of that, because I want to get kind of to the end quickly, is I start building on the shadows because the shadow automatically gives me awesome form, you know, and it lets me, it lets me really see what's happening. You know, it brings it to life and I can move quickly through. It's like, okay, I'm getting, getting more inspired because I've seen the drawing too long. This piece probably took me three hours to, by the time I finished noodling with it and then pushing things around and making a small adjustments. Um, redrawing the boots a couple of times. So then once the, you know, the shadows are, are, are in and then that's set to a multiply layer. Most of the time I either use a kind of a, uh, a lavender color or kind of an ochre, an ochre orangey yellow, uh, kind of color, depending on, on what the background is. And that will change the way the shadow, um, relates or, or shows the, the background plays through the, the colors. And after that, um, I set in, this is my accent color. So effectively, this is my, my, my main light. And then I'm just highlighting, adding in my, adding, accenting my key light to, to really bring out the form and show kind of rich volume and what's happening. And, and so I use a lot of rounded forms. So these are the things that, that I try to focus on. And that is uh, usually always set to an add, an add layer. So if I change that, and I hope you can see my cursor, but you know, if there's add glow is actually what it should be set to. Um, it works for this scenario, and you can see that that small change makes a makes a huge difference on whether it feels more like a matte surface, um, or whether it feels like a it's a little more lustery, you know. Um, and obviously, it warms up the light and plays off of the cooler cooler shadow. Um, from there, I then end up adding um, the rim light, so the accent light from, from the background, usually just to highlight forms and bring out um, elements that I think kind of really make it pop. And you can see the difference. And then from there, it's really about the accent glowy bits and you know, these are, those are the part, that's when, when I get to the glowy bits, I'm super happy. And I think that this is where the drawing is kind of done, you know, and then classically, I like to throw a frame around it just to kind of accent uh, what it's doing, the motion. So your eye kind of travels and you start at the ground and you, you move up. So anything that, that really makes it uh, appealing and kind of frames the whole piece um, to kind of bring everything together. So then we can look at uh, the girl. So this drawing is interesting as well. I mean, we don't have to go into it. These, this is a done, all these drawings are done exactly the same way. Um, so it's really this character. I love this character, um, but I, I just, I have to probably have to do something with this character in terms of a graphic novel or, or something. I just, her, the little, her little dog bot and the expression on her face and, I think she's very playful, but it's just this idea of trying to do something that captures a character. I had a discussion actually once with um, someone at at a at a at, an, at a broadcaster, um, and I won't name any names or anything. But they, one of the, I was pitching a show, and one of the things they said to me is, you know, I was like, hey, you know, why you only do robots, and you know, do you have anything else? Because we're not really sure that people, that kids will connect with robots. It's you know, and I said, well, that's, I don't, I, don't, I said, that's, to tell you that, honestly, I said it was 100% BS because I think, I don't know what kids imagine that think that they're dinosaurs. They don't have any way to relate to that, you know, in the same way. It's really about how the character on the screen is being, is, how, is the character emote? That's the thing. You can put a, you can put a stick on screen and if, you know, if it's done the right way, animated and written in the right way, anybody can connect to it. So I think this is one of the things, but people assume that robots and technology are cold. But I find that completely 
the wrong way of thinking about it. It's really about what we put into it. So this character um, is, I think she's very appealing and I'd love to explore this idea, but she was done in the exact same way as the captain. Um, she has her base layer done as a, as a file, turn it all off and you can see. So you can see as it, the layers that have built up. And they're all quite quite independent until you get the line in there and you can see the difference between just the standard forms, which is one way of illustrating. I just for this particular thing, I don't I usually I love illustrated line. I love that form. Painting painting without line is is very appealing to me, but I love the kind of cartoons and graphic nature of the line. So when you're adding in the line, really brings the form together. And it's less processy for me, I think. There's, the line is very satisfying right away. Um, so this character, anyways, it's, it's just a, a, great, a great thing to come up with something that excites you when you draw it. Because, you know, many people, I'm sure, you know, if you go through, if you're kind of an aspiring artist or you, you want to tell a story, you want to do all these things, it's really about the finding your your voice and your confidence and what do I draw and how do I do this and and there's a lot of things that you know the process can be daunting at, at times so you, you know you don't want to do it or whatever so you have to find those elements and it's a very isolated idea of being an artist you're painting and you're thinking by yourself I spend a lot of time in my head so you know when I'm communicating the ideas and I'm building these worlds you get lost and it's wonderful and it's nice when you find something that you can really connect with and, you, and it starts to you hope that if it's if it's in, if it's inspiring you and you want to tell the story that i can really i can maybe reach out to somebody and connect with somebody else can connect with this character and they can really like it so that's part of the thing that i like to really kind of communicate because all of this all of this comes together and kind of has real world applications um because there's a thing called steam out in the world and that's basically kind of this idea of the science technology engineering uh, and liberal arts and mathematics and that's you know teaching teaching young people and anyone who's learning but in the educational system specifically about taking these the you know science and technology engineering and math and then bringing it together with the liberal arts and really solving a lot of the world's problems and, and creating things to put into the world right i mean you know it's it's all of these all these elements have to work together so the the idea of me creating kind of appealing robots and telling stories with those robots, um, future, future forward looking, um, is me trying to contribute to that kind of idea. Because if you see this stuff all day, every day, and you see robots, to me, in, in acting out in in regular life, and then you start to accept it, right? It's this idea they're not foreign anymore. So if my I just had a daughter a year ago, and so I want to make things that are important to her, and she sees. This idea is like, oh, these are commonplace, not the, not some kind of weird, weird thing that I I don't want to talk about, right? Or I don't want to have any part of it. the robots and coding and all these elements are really important. So that's why I love the positive uh, idea, um, ideas I like to put out, and I want to make sure that it's communicated that way because I think that it, there's a lot of negativity, negativity, for the most part, you know, and and people think they have really kind of straightforward ideas about what technology is going to be and what the future is going to be. And most of it, as you see, watch any movie, none of it starts out, you know, or ends, or usually in the middle, actually, it's always the, the crappy part. But, you know, people's view of the future is always kind of negative. So I want to bring that out because I love, you know, growing up in the 80s, um, I love Astro Boy. I love Robotech. I love all these things. And, and the one thing about the designs is, is funny is, is Robotech is, in case anybody doesn't know, it's an animation that was done back in the 80s uh, in Japan, it was Japanese anime, but it's just about war, right, basically. And it's a love story, but, you know, based in the theater of war. So all of these ideas are coming together. I love anything that kind of brings and celebrates the positivity and looking forward. Um, that's why I want to keep doing what I'm doing. So to look at these other two characters. These are some, some other 
elements that questions that I get all the time about kind of, you know, these things can be anything. So looking at um, looking at this ro the, the green the green robot here, basically on the on the far right, is basically just just an exploration. If you there's a movie called The Black Hole, that was done by Walt Disney, and there was a character named uh, Maximilian. So this is kind of Maximilian ish, um, but it's really me explaining and showing the idea of of, of a form and how do you shadow to bring out that form and then all the little uh, guts bits inside that really make it interesting and, and, and show you what the character does. Now, you, obviously, this character is not going to bend at the waist if you want to talk about anatomical needs, right, in terms of the functionality. But, you know, he also has a, he doesn't have any arms and he's got two stumpy little floating thighs. So I'm not really sure what he does in general. But, um, and then obviously the, the, the other character has has no limbs whatsoever. He's just a lollipop character, and it's just funny. It's more inspired by the little um, the little pin that we put in in virtual maps, but you know, and then a lollipop. Cause I think I happened to be at Starbucks at the time, and the cake pops are crazy. So um, that's not a plug for Starbucks, just the cake pops. Uh, yeah, and that was just a really fun exploration. And you can see that the, the variation in line. Um, as well, and then the the quality of the line it doesn't really matter. So it's amazing how when you draw something rough, um, and then you just splash a little color in it, automatically the line just is there to to help sell sell the rest of it. But the color is really what takes over, um, and is kind of the main thing to focus on. And, and once you start adding in the color and the shadow, it really brings it to life. And that's really where the where the energy kind of comes from. So and one of the things you'll notice also is the difference between the characters, uh, this character's in innards with with the, the mechanical bits versus this uh, lollipop character has a kind of a graphic display. And it's all very 70s, uh, 70s behind the glass kind of blinky lights, you know. So the, that's, that's another way to, um, or one way to express uh, the level of technology that you're playing with as well. So um, I'm a I'm a big fan of anything blinky lights anywhere. So that's it's almost it's almost impossible for me to do a drawing without it. So now I'm going to let's I'm going to jump into uh, the March of Robots. The actual event um, is a is happening now and today is the today is the second day man holy cow um, march of robots i started back in uh 2014 officially um as a response to um jake parker's uh inktober which i thought found very inspiring and i just you know foolishly thought i could just do something privately by myself on instagram um and then i you know it was called Bottober at the time but then there was a crazy influx of Tobers, you know, sketch Tober, draw Tober, monster Tober, everything Tober. So I decided 2013, I was going to jump out and 2014 rolled around and I said, okay, March of Robots seems like a, like a fun place. And there was nothing else happening at the time. Um, so I started to do that. So basically it's a, it's a community drawing uh, uh, challenge. It's 31 days, 31 robots, you, can, you know, original designs. Um, they can be digitally drawn. They can be uh, analog, you could 3D sculpt them if you really wanted to. It doesn't really matter. I think you could make them out of plaster scene, whatever it is. It's just, it's about people coming together to celebrate this idea of creativity and expression um, around the theme of robots. So uh, a couple of years back, I got a lot of requests for a prompt list. So I started putting together prompt lists and I appreciate it. I don't really use them all the time. Sometimes they're fun. And they're, they're really great if you need a, a little inspiration. And, and it's great when somebody says design something, it's really complicated to get down to it, but um, it's, it's a challenge, right? It's, it is the blank page. But so when I, you know, when put out the, put out the prompt list, that gives you something to start from and it can be anything. So it doesn't, you know, chunky can be anything you want, right? It could be chunky boots. It could be a chunky head. It could be, you know, it could be a, a robot eating a chunky chocolate chip cookie. It doesn't really matter. I think it's really about you wanting to tell the story with the inspiration of the word for the day. 
Um, so if you, I would love anyone who's out there to, to join in and, and, and come on by and participate. What do you think, Joanna? Um, yeah, absolutely. I would love for everyone to participate because there seems to be just an endless amount of tiny, cute robots that need to be out there in the world. <laughs> no, that, that, I totally agree. I think I can't, I can never have enough to cuddly robots. Yeah. So that brings me to a very important question. How did you start just with the robots? Did you try anything else? <laughs> oh yeah, I've drawn, no, I've drawn tons of stuff. I, I just found that I, I looked back over all the stuff and the thing, the thing that excited me, I mean, you, you draw people, but then there's always a robot in the scene or robots were fascinating. The one thing about robots that I find amazing is that they're basically kind of a mirror to ourselves, right? I mean, robots are designed or developed <clears throat> and then they're put out into the world and then their job is just to collect data mm. and, and assess the environment and, um, and kind of grow, right? So that, you, you know, you go through, if you were a robot, you're going through life and you're modifying your, your oh, my arm needs to change or I need to upgrade my software. Or I need to, you know, get bigger boots. I need to do something. So it's kind of, we do that as we go through life. So, you know, kind of robots journey through life is really about, you know, if you watch a little baby or any individual kind of growing and learning, robots are just a wonderful thing. And I just like the forms and the stories I'm able to tell. It's interesting because I, I think that it's kind of like when people, if you want to talk, ta uh, tackle a topic, you know, um, kind of sending a message about something, it's great when you can, you know, use little animals or, or something that's not human. It, it tends to, the message tends to get heard better. So yeah. I just happen to like robots. A lot of people out there drawing zombies and, and everything else. I just, it's just super appealing to me. I'm just, you know, that's, it's yeah. as simple as that. Robots are cool. Yeah. Do you look at like real robots from Boston Dynamics? Oh yeah, I, I look at everything. Like I said, robots are the one thing you know that you have to kind of pay attention to a little bit. If the way I design, you have to pay attention to functionality. Because if I do suffer a video game, it has to work for the most part. Depending on you know the level of video games, kind of now you can't hide. Like back in the day, old school Transformers, everything was super boxy. And if you've ever if you were ever a kid trying to make a robot suit out of cardboard boxes, you realize how fast those joints don't work. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, so, so you can't put a box and a box touching each other to try to make an elbow joint. It's just impossible. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just kind of this idea of, you know, looking at looking at other robots and seeing what actually needs to be a thing is great because that is kind of a real world driver, right? And then mm -hmm. looking at other people's interpretations is interesting as well because that 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 those are not necessarily driven by any kind of real, real logic, but it's nice to explore form, you know, and, and see what other people's thinking, um, where it's at. Mm. Um, when you design a robot, do you start with a purpose or with a shape? I think it's both. It depends on if I'm, you know, Sunday and I'm drinking a cup of tea and doing nothing, then sometimes I'm just doodling and a, and a form happens, you know, but most of the time for me, I'm usually inspired by something like I want to tell a story. And so I start to kind of shape it. Like, oh, it needs to be this or it needs to be that. Um, and then I start, you know, that becomes my design brief. Right. Mm. Like, I said, like I said before, if you if you if you just have a blank page, it's really intimidating. You don't know which direction to go. But if you start to create limits and 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 um, and purpose for the thing, like, oh, I have to create a, a robot that that uh that's a it's a scuba diving robot and and it, it it looks for gold and it's on a on a on a moon or or whatever it is you know what i mean it's kind of this idea of other planet water planet of some sort you know then you have you say okay i have to do this and i have to do that and then so then once that is kind of done what it looks like actually at the end with the shell that you wrap it in that's another that's another deal and that also has to do with form and function but mm -hmm. but for the most part it's the function and it, it, it's everything kind of at once. And it, there's no necessarily no first rule that happens in terms of where you start. Yeah. Um, so how, <clears throat> excuse me, how far do you go in terms of imagining a story for each individual robot? I go pretty far. I mean, for that, for the, the actual illustration, I usually try to stop it there because I have a backlog in my head of other things that need to get out. But um, if it's something like that character, uh, Sora, which is her name 
um, mm. and then the little dog. That once that drawing's kind of done, I start I start imagining kind of her purpose and you know potentially where she is. And if I feel I write I write everything down and I kind of make a little bit of a, a kind of a a brief description for myself. And then I, I I put it down and I come back to it a little later. And I, if I feel I you know I have the same passion for it, and I start to explore it a little bit more and start to write uh, quite quickly. Yeah. Has any of this ever gone into like a private um, work of a graphic novel or anything like that? Yeah, I did a I did a short film a couple of years ago um, that was done out of with a company called Nimble Collective. And then I was invited by the founder of one of the founders to participate in the pilot program. And he wanted to fund a short film and any ideas I had. So I, I created a little thing. I had some drawings that I'd done of two characters that were kind of interesting, but they were more exploration in style than anything else. I just wanted to see if I could, you know, how to draw robots that look like they came out of the same factory, basically, right? They exist in the same world. Hmm. And I used kind of Sonny and Gerd. They, they were named Sonny and they are named Sonny and Gerd, but I, I mean, I used Ernie and Bert from Sesame Street as kind of the inspiration <laughs> of of their personalities. And then I designed from there. So, you know, we did the short film and it's really developing the story and the world. So I, when I when I did that story initially, it was a great little drawing. And then I said, OK, well, if I have to make a film, then I'm going to try to write a synopsis and do a brief for a film the whole feature film kind of idea. And then I broke that back down into kind of a TV show. And then I broke that back down into um, a short film and little episodes. And so that was how that kind of came together. And so that was, that was interesting. And I'd love to explore that. And I did a VR pitch for it as well to kind of extend the world. And so there's a whole, there's a whole thing wrapped around that. So I'm excited about that. Hmm. Very cool. Um, let's go a bit more into the technical side of your work because you have some art questions. Um, mm -hmm. So for one, <clears throat> um, you you explained a bit about the 3D shapes in space. Mm -hmm. And have you ever worked in 3D with uh, with your robots personally? Yeah, I've worked in 3D. My 3D skills are horrible. I've done a lot of work in VR. I find mm -hmm. it's, it's a fantastic place to get to get the ideas out because it's it's so immediate. So and, and the VR and I've used medium. I'm starting to dabble into gravity sketch. So I think these are the, I think the immersive element uh, the component of VR is fantastic and it allows me to shape things quite quickly. So that's where I'm, that's where I'm headed. Okay, very cool. Um, <clears throat> how do you keep the balance um, of the robots in terms of detail and weight? Uh, you know, it just, I think, it, I don't know if there's a rule I and mean, there might be a rule. So I'm self-taught. So anything I'm telling you is just me kind of guessing at how things kind of <laughs> really go. I don't, I don't have the, I don't, I didn't go to school to say like I had a teacher tell me all this stuff and I'm just kind of regurgitating it in my style, which I wish I had sometimes because it would be a lot easier. Hmm. So I think the balance is really about, it's really about feel, right? I mean, I think when you're, when you're putting an idea together, it has to look, you know, it has to feel good when you're doing it so the weights have to transfer I mean, and, and there's no people there are some classic rules you know the, the 70 30 and 80 20 whatever golden ratios yada yada yadas but i think i think if you look at something and it, and it feels good you know the level of details it's really what you need it to be so if it's supposed to be kind of light and cartoony if you're looking at something from let's say you know uh like calvin and Hobbes, then you're only going to put so much detail into it right before it starts to pull itself out of the world but mm -hmm. if you're looking at doing designing something for star wars then you're going to need a certain amount of like everything in star wars has a certain amount of grit and scratches and grime and and panels and and that you can understand that there's a there's a need for people to do maintenance on robots right so you know calvin and Hobbes, you just have one panel one simple thing you know you're not worried about hinges you're not worried about all this other stuff so it's really about whatever you determine the level the finish level needs to be whatever the world it exists in. You know, that is, that's what usually determines how much, how far you go. Assuming that you have control over your noodling gene, because I like to noodle forever. <laughs> so for those who don't know, noodling is the, the process of spending forever on details. Yeah, and then all the way through, it doesn't matter, all the way yeah. through. 
So classically, yeah. I, I'm one of these people who I don't do a lot of iterative work. So mm. iterative work is, you know, you know, you'll have a, a robot design or a character design and people will do five or six or eight or 10 of them. And there'll be such minute changes. I hate looking at those things. I can't tell. It's like, it's like looking for a where's Waldo. I can't really tell yeah. what's different. So I started kind of in this idea of industrial design and, and, and uh, architecture. So the, the, the moves have to be kind of bold for me when it comes to hmm. what the changes are. But I tend to look at one drawing and sculpt it. You know what I mean? And, and I do a little sketch draw over top of it and you know, do drop the opacity and refine the form as opposed to starting again. So hmm. that, that helps a little bit for me because I, I start, I want to dial it in quite quickly, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. there are infinite, there are an infinite amount of kind of solutions almost to any particular challenge. I think um, you can go many directions. This could be that and that can be this, but at some point you have to realize that, you know, pretty much any answer that you come up with that feels great, probably a good one. Hmm. <laughs> um. To go into Club Studio a little bit, what kind of brushes do you usually use for for drawing your robots? Um, I'm. This is going to be super boring, but I I literally have um, less than five brushes. So, the, and I use one pencil all the time, and it's just this pencil. I, I think it actually came out of one of the packs that we're giving away, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, it's just pencil number four. <laughs> um, but I I tend to in this window sorry this resolution is killing me sorry um you know even all of these i tried like i throw it away i throw away every brush almost that i get i, I want to start from a naked palette um, mm. so i use i use the g for inking it's a lot of g pen mm. I think it's called the g pen and then um is it in, even in here so this is a new setup and I'm trying to, yeah, so the G pen and that this cross hatching thing, I don't even mm -hmm. use it, but um, I tend to, I have very little. So the G pen, this is the only, this anchor, I haven't emptied out the anchor yet because there's, because it's crazy. There's so much <laughs> good stuff in there. Um, and I have one dense watercolor brush. I, I like to keep it super simple because I, I, I find that the more the more the more distracting all the tools and everything it gets unnecessarily complicated and i and i love graphic line so it's easy for me to to focus when i have a limited amount of tools so that the g pen and then that pencil four the four pencil number four and pencil number seven hmm. when the pencil number seven is not even necessary so that's literally it and even when it comes to painting i use i use flat color most of the time and then one airbrush Super simple. You can find it in any program. You know what I mean? Mm, so, yeah. And, and then, but other than this, there's a pointillism brush that's in that's in uh, Clip Studio. Yeah. That I did a I did a short film pitch, and it had these this kind of you ever see those birds and I think it's in Italy and they you know they come out and they swirl and they and they yeah. And it, you know, <laughs> this brush yeah, yeah. does exactly that thing, and I wish I had that brush. So now I'm gonna re go revisit this project. And actually use this brush it's it's amazing oh very cool <laughs> so um you do a lot of your work mostly for instagram and you have your coloring book and stuff like that so do you uh, do you ever work with vectors for printing or do you mostly work on um regular layers no right no i i'm trying to get more into i come from an, illust an illustrator point of uh, school of, of thinking. So I used to do tons of vector and I still do a lot of vector, right? Um, that's my that's my main shtick actually. Um, so mm. the, what the thing about, the thing I love about um, Clip Studio is it has the vector tool in it, which I really love the crisp line. And I, I've done a lot, of, I do a lot of work um, that needs to be scaled. So instead of working at some ridiculous resolution, you know, for a piece, it's great to have the vectors to work mm. on. And and it, my style allows me. You can't really tell the difference whether I'm using raster, raster images or vector because of the mm. style I work in. So that's the great thing about it. So I, that's why, you know, I don't want to say I hate Adobe, but I just love, <laughs> I love what Clip Studio brings to the table. It's fantastic in terms of the flexibility. And then I'm starting to explore the earlier the short film with Sunny and Gerd, the comic, the comic thing is just mm. amazing to me. So I, I'm really excited to explore tell storytelling with the uh, yeah. with clip studio 
Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you create a color palette for a specific robot once you have the idea? Or do the colors evolve while you're drawing? The colors evolve if it stays as a separate um, drawing. Again, it's really about what you want to end up using it for. So I think the color palette as to say this is a robot that's supposed to be law enforcement or it's supposed to be a research vehicle or it's, it's some kind of recreational. So now it's got stickers all over it and something crazy. So that develops as I'm going along. But then as if the story evolves and, you know, the, you know, have robots, let's say you have a story of, of, of three characters who all have their own robots. All of a sudden you have to design, you, you, you have a need now to design color palette for each character and to make them stand out and then, but it still has to be harmonious, right? So you, you kind of noodle and you, and you, and you tweak until it kind of, if there's a binding, a binding element, like they all work for the same place, or if they're, they're, they're a ragtag bunch of, uh, of characters that came together, you know, so you can, you can see they came from different places, you know, it depends on what they speak to. If one guy was born in, in the jungles of Belize and another person was born in, in, in Reykjavik, you know what I mean? And then somebody, you know, from outer space and all the color palettes would be different, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but you try to stick to like certain colors for like one particular robot. And do you have like a, a color limit that you wouldn't go over? Like a lot of them are like really focused. No, I, again, I think it, it depends if it, I mean, if I'm doing an eighties robot, then it's going to be, you know, eighties crazy neon everywhere. Right. And then, <laughs> you know, if it's supposed to be a dark, kind of stealthy robot you stick with the muted dark tones mm. you know and then kind of whether how set saturated or desaturated depending on on the, the tone of the of the overall overall world you know what i mean you can you yeah, can do yeah. it you know so i think yeah it's, it, it really is driven by whatever the need happens to be but it, it, the palette is you know like i said i said earlier the, you, there are only actually seven colors to choose from so for me it's a little daunting to figure out how to do something more original even just doing this poster for march of robots every year is kind of annoying because I have to figure out a new <laughs> color combo, but but yeah, it's it's you know it's really about kind of making sure that you're not going too far because a little is a lot, hmm. you know. And if you go overboard, then you you can't do you can't put all of the great ideas into one drawing because then you could only do one drawing. Yeah, yeah. So save it for later. <laughs> there will um, be more. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, how long does does it usually take you to create like one robot? Just a general, very general um, uh, average. Yeah, I guess. Okay, so assuming that the end result is kind of a print quality mm -hmm. deal and factoring in an, ex an additional hour for noodling, probably I've spent minimum 40 minutes to an hour on a drawing and it's been Holy cow, that's amazing. And then other times I'm banging my head for, for five hours. <laughs> but it depends on the detail, right? And then and then how finished yeah. it needs to be. Like I I've done I did some work for um uh a film festival here as the art director, and I think the first things I ever did were a stack of nine robots, and each one from start to finish took me 18 hours. Oh my god. So to go from the sketch and had to unify them all together and they had to be very uh, diverse in mm -hmm. their look and then each one of those the, the majority of that time once they finished the design they were actually get they actually got printed eight feet tall so doing them in vector mean meant that i had to make sure that every point was connected and there was no flaws mm -hmm. you know what i mean or because you, know, you make a yeah. mistake you blow it up eight feet tall you're going to see it really clearly yeah, yeah. So it depends on the need, and I, I will never do that again. And I'm plus I'm much faster. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it took me from sketch to kind of to to vector final render prepping the file took me 18, 16 to 18 hours each one. Hmm. Wow. That it's always a bit scary seeing like art that goes so big, and you you try not to like um, spend too much time on perfecting lines. And then they no, no, get totally. blown up so so big, and they're like, "Oh my God, the line's not perfect." <laughs> yeah, if you if you have it, I've seen. I I was I went to I think my first trip to Japan, I saw I walked by a, a store that had you know, it was a comic a manga store, and then on the outside was giant. I think they were they had to be at least like eight eight feet tall, but all the illustrations of the characters, all the pencil lines, I could see. Yeah. You know what I mean? They they weren't super tight inked. They were mm -hmm. rough, rough pencil and all the color was beautiful. 
but they love the text left the texture of the pencil yeah. the digital pencil and i thought that was amazing because i didn't even notice it until i noticed it hmm. you know so i think depending on what you're how you're working i said you splash color on the simplest of drawings and it comes to life hmm. you know it starts it starts the volume starts to become a thing and, and it really you, the, the lines kind of fade away and then the, the piece is just there in front of you yeah okay we have another question that is uh what type of robot would you be if you were to draw yourself as a robot oh man what kind of robot? <laughs> no that's a that's a I don't know. I don't think I've ever drawn myself as a robot. That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's a good question. I probably, I probably realistically, I need a, <clears throat> I'd probably be a multi-armed robot. So, I'd have, <laughs> so for sure, I'd have to have at least four arms to do multiple illustrations. It's funny thing is like, it's the one thing where, you know, if you're a robot, then why do you need to draw at all? But if, if you have it, cause I could just plug myself in and the image would just appear, but it would be a very large headed, multi-armed robot i think because i need the hard drive space up there to, <laughs> you know to keep i think that would be super simple i don't know they had yeah. probably it either that or a little cute cat-esque cat -esque robot <laughs> <laughs> did, did, when working with projects did you ever feel like oh my god i don't know anymore i have no more ideas for robots oh every day <laughs> every day i have no ideas I, it's just, I just, I'm amazed that anybody wants to watch it or do like, is interested in anything I do, but uh, no, you know what? I think, I think that there's so many small variations that can happen. And once you, it's really about the story, right? And the story will pull those ideas out. So, you know, if you look at, I think if you look at most things in the world, there are only so many variations of that thing and it doesn't matter what it is, I mean, even mm. people, right? I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen so many Italian versions of my Japanese friends. It's ridiculous. Like it's, you know what I mean? Everybody kind of shares little features. So when you do, when you see, I think it's infinite amount of, of ideas. If you're drawing, I don't, I don't know how many trash collecting robots you can draw. You know what I mean? I think there's a limit, right? But if in the world and then tasks that the amount of tasks that one could, could design a robot for is infinite. Right. So I think that, I mean, robots are one of those things that I think will be our best hope for exploring the universe. Hmm. You know what I mean, when we get off this planet, because we were built here, but robots are, can be built to survive anywhere, right? We're not limited hmm. by, by our, our, they're not limited by our bubble. Yeah. So the universe is infinite. So the amount of things out there for the robot to need to do and to explore, I think I could, I could challenge. I mean, I think it's, it'll, it'll always look like me, like I did it, yeah. you know? I think that's a thing um, and I love that idea. Of, of setting kind of a style like it, it's interesting to see on on, on march of robots people are are learning to draw and they're adopting my shape language and joint language it's it's fun to watch you know and see people mm. do that it's, it's great um but it, yeah I, I don't think i could ever really run out of ideas i always worry at the beginning that i have no ideas but it turns out i actually do have a lot <laughs> yes um yeah i mean just going through instagram there are just like so many robots um and some have very simple shapes. I think you have like an egg robot and it still looks like a robot. So if you have one one tip to make a robot look more like a robot, what would that be? Oh, I gonna I was I was joking if you put a seam line on anything, it becomes a robot. Right? Like really that's the thing, because I think that the idea of you can take a drawing of a human, a beautifully rendered, realistic, hyper realistic picture of 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 a person and if you draw a seam line across their throat or along their cheek like it's supposed to be a little hatch or something automatically they become they become an android you know what i mean yeah that's the that's the that's the great thing about that kind of idea it doesn't take much to communicate because you could imagine you know, the seam line and then you would just peel the seam line back and the wonderfully textured um subsurface scattering silicon skin reveals you know blinky glowy lights in this you know, there is no, there are things characteristically that, oh, that's definitely a robot. It's made of plastic, made of metal, made of wood, and it's stiff joints. And you can see those things. Those are the, those are the clear calls for something to be a robot. It's very, it has, has segments, segments and components and, 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 and kind of is designed as a thing, as opposed to, you know, putting, putting, you know, a hard drive with, with some kind of 
motors in it in a in a bowl of jello is that a robot i don't know you know what i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah anything can be anything can be anything it's really about what's beneath the what's the reveal right so there's you know yeah. like in, in in the classic movie blade runner i mean the symbi the uh the replicants they, they, they look like humans right but it's be what's below the surface hmm. all right okay um that's i think all the time we have for questions thank you so much that was a great chat <laughs> awesome I, i'm glad i hope somebody got something out of it that that two, my two cents feel free to get back change <laughs> all right thank you so much and i hope everyone's going to participate in march of robots Mario, well, thank you very much for the invite it's fantastic it's, it's great to have clip studio yeah. to, to talk about this stuff yeah. And um, thank you so much, Joanna, and thank you so much, uh, Acosta. It's been a very inspiring webinar, and yes. uh, we also appreciate a lot to everyone who's still with us here on the webinar. Um, we we'll also like to uh, remind you that for more information about uh, Clip Studio Paint, um, just visit us on our website, clipstudiopaint.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com and um, also this webinar is being recorded and um, we'll share it on our social media soon please follow Celsius web and also graphicsly or Celsius uh, youtube channel and also graphicsly youtube channel and for more information about da costa and all of his projects and um, please uh, follow him on instagram and just check his website, chocolatesoup.com. All right, thank you very and much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Joanna and um, Acosta. And, and before finishing the broadcast, I would like you to remember that during the month of March, we are supporting Acosta and the March of Robot uh, Drawing Challenge. Uh, we encourage you to participate on this fun challenge and also with several giveaways that will be happening during the month. And uh, last but not, not least, uh, as an attendee, you have a chance to win one copy of Clip Studio Paint X and two superhero brush sets. So winners will be drawn randomly from the list of the event's attendees and will be announced after the webinar. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to see you again in our next events. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.